What's up YouTube, I'm Guy, and today on the channel we are going to finally get to our comparison review of the Rolex Submariner and the Genoa Ocean Rover. There's been a lot of you guys chomping at the bit to see this video. I've gotten a lot of messages asking me when it's going to be ready. So today I'm working on it. Hopefully it will be released on Thursday, and hopefully you guys will enjoy it. Now, for a little bit of context, if uh, you don't already know, last week I reviewed the Genoa Ocean Rover, sort of did an unboxing and first impressions. I wanted to do a standalone video that was somewhat foundational to the watch on its own or in its own right. I didn't want to have the context of the Rolex Submariner sitting right next to it so that I could tell you what I thought about it by itself. And as you're probably aware, if you saw that review, I really do like this watch. I think it's excellent, very, very high quality. But the question is, will it stand up to the Rolex Submariner? Well, we'll find out in just a minute. I do want to preface this by saying that Jeannot reached out to me and asked if I would be interested in doing this. They specifically wanted a comparison review of their watch with the Submariner. They're very confident in their product, but they did say they want me to be honest and forthcoming. They don't want me to hold anything back. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to set those watches side by side. We're going to compare and contrast them. I'm going to show you some of the places that the Genoa falls a little bit short of the Rolex. And of course, it, it does. You know, there's no reason that you would think it wouldn't. The, the Submariner is almost eight times the money, and that money has to go somewhere. But as you probably know from that original Genoa review, I do think it's an outstanding watch. And the amount of differences is surprisingly small. Uh, I'm looking forward to showing this to you guys, so we're going to jump over to the tabletop right now and get right into it. How could we possibly compare the Genoa Ocean Rover, a $1,499 MSRP watch, to the Rolex Submariner with its MSRP of $8,550? It would seem sort of ridiculous to even consider that these two watches are in a similar class, given their price differential. But, surprisingly, they're not that far apart in terms of quality, in terms of craftsmanship, in the fit and finish. Overall, the Genoa is an outstanding watch. Does it fall a little behind the Rolex? Of course it does. But it's just by degrees of difference, minor levels of variation that really prevent it from actually coming to that same level as the Submariner. There's a saying that says, when you spend money on luxury goods, there comes levels of diminishing returns or something like that. I don't know if I'm quoting that exactly perfectly, but... That's true. When you look at a watch like the Rolex, you get diminishing returns the more and more money you spend. If we go down into the ultra-affordable entry level, there's some great $100 and $200 watches out there. You can move on up to the $500 level and you see watches that are better, but are they more than double better? We often have to ask ourselves that question. As you consider continue to escalate up the scale of pricing, the the distance or the gap in quality between watches at those different tiers gets narrower and narrower as the prices increase, and that's what we're seeing here. Let's go ahead and first take a look at the cases of these watches. Now, the construction of the Submariner is their own design or own formula of 904L stainless steel. The Genoa uses... 316L, which is somewhat ubiquitous in the watch world as the go-to material for building or constructing a stainless steel watch. Is the 904L significantly better than the 316L? I mean, honestly, I'm not a, a, a metallurgist. I don't really know. Let's take their word for it and assume that the 904L is a superior material. Moving on from that, something that we have to take note of the Genoa uses a design that is somewhat of an homage of the previous generation, now currently discontinued, five-digit reference number Submariners. 
You can see in the lugs of these watches, and we'll line them up a little bit here side by side slightly better. On the right hand side, the Genot Ocean Rover. The lugs here are much thinner, they taper down to not exactly a point, but a much thinner distance at the ends or the outer horns of the lugs than we see on the Submariner. If I pick these watches up and bring them in a little bit closer to the camera, you'll probably see it even more clearly. The new referenced, six-digit referenced Submariners do have what they call the Super Case. This is actually a point of contention for a lot of people that are not fans of this new design. The case is beefier, it's chunkier, it wears bigger on the wrist despite the fact that it has a 40 millimeter, uh, 40 millimeter uh, case diameter. Uh, so, you know, if you're a fan of the old style Submariners, you're probably going to like this Genot quite a bit. This Genot is an amalgamation of designs taken from different eras of Rolex Submariners, and I think that in almost every case they chose the right era or model of Submariner to homage to incorporate into their designs. That said, this is not purely an apples-to-apples -apples comparison because of that, because these watches are somewhat different in their design cues, so keep that in mind. In terms of finishing on the case, let's take an up-close look at the Rolex. You can see that the tops of the lugs, the end links of the bracelet, and the bracelet links themselves are a very beautiful, very fine, straight-lined, grain, satiny brushed finish. And the sides of the case are basically a high mirrored polish, as you can see here. It's done flawlessly. It's basically what you would expect in terms of quality from a watch built by Rolex. The back of the case, of course, has their basically naked screw down case back. It's got a polished outer edge with the flat of the case back being that same excellent brushed finish. Overall, the fit and finish on the Oyster case that Rolex builds is stunning. There's, you know, no other way to put it. Let's bring the Ocean Rover here up in frame and take a look at the finish on that case. It is also very well done. You can see that on the lugs of the case of the Ocean Rover, it's not the same straight north to south style, north to south style brushed pattern or grain as the Rolex, and it's a little bit coarser. Not so much that you would even notice it with the naked eye from three feet away, but up here close, it is visible. The finishing is quite good though, don't get me wrong. Higher quality than a lot of more affordable watches that I've reviewed in the past. So don't take that as a criticism of the watch. I'm just pointing out that there is a difference in terms of the finish of the brushwork on the two watches. Now considering that this watch is a homage to the older style case, that might be an accurate style of brush, you know, the, uh, the same the direction of the grain and the coarseness of the brushing, that might be accurate, but in comparing it to an absolutely brand new modern Submariner, it is a little bit different. Though I wouldn't call it bad, I wouldn't say I dislike it, it's still very well done. Just a little bit different, as you can see on the tops of the lugs, the end links of the bracelet, and the bracelet links themselves. Now the mirror polished on the side, honestly, I can't tell a difference at all. The mirror polishing on this Genot Ocean Rover is absolutely outstanding. No complaints there whatsoever. If I was looking at these two watches side by side, I wouldn't be able to tell that this is using 316L stainless steel instead of 904. I wouldn't be able to tell that it was polished by different companies or different people. There is a whole lot of quality in the fit and finish of the case on this Oyster style Genot case, don't get me wrong, but there is just a slight variation or difference in the quality of the brushing. Next we're going to talk about the crowns on these two watches, and they are almost indistinguishable in the, the difference between them. Obviously the Rolex has the Coronet logo, and the Genot has their flower lotus, I don't know exactly what kind of flower logo, emblazoned on their crown, but the rest of the crowns, even so much as the action of screwing them down and hand winding the movements, it's, it's difficult to tell the difference. We'll come in real close here on the Rolex crown, Look at that knurling pattern, the texturing on the crown. 
It is some of the best in the business. It has a very good bite so that when you grip the crown to rotate it to unscrew the crown from the case, I mean, it is just buttery, flawless, smooth. Once you get it out into that first hand winding position, we expose the rubber seal gasket of the Triplock Rolex crown there, and it's absolutely amazing. No, no other way to describe it. If we look here at the Genoa's crown, it's really basically the same level of quality. I can't hardly tell a difference. We get the same excellent texturing on the crown, maybe not quite as aggressive to the touch, but so very close that it's hard to tell a difference. It screws down with that same buttery smooth action as you unthread it from the case. And of course, we can see the same style trip lock crown gasket there at the base of the crown's tube. You're getting 300 meters of water resist with this watch, and it's using basically the same style of technology in the seals on this crown. Hand winding the crown feels equally as buttery smooth as it does on the Rolex, and of course they're using entirely different movements inside the watch to run these mechanisms. So that's an impressive feature. I mean, something that you're really not going to notice, but if you're sitting here side by side and really analyzing them, really trying to compare one to the other, yeah, it is uh, surprising how much they feel like basically the same watch. If your eyes were closed and you were hand winding one or the other, you'd be challenged to tell a difference. When we're talking about the crowns, it's also probably worth noting the crown guards on the case. As you can see, the metal guards protruding off of the sides of the case on the left, the Rolex, on the right, the Genoa. The Rolex using the super case has more pronounced crown guards on the Genoa. Mimicking the older style five digit Submariners, you have those more understated crown guards. It's another thing that people are going to love about the styling cues that Genoa has decided to use on their watch here, on this particular example of a Submariner homage, maybe one of the best Submariner homages on the market. I did show you the Submariner's case back, and I should probably point out that the Genoa case back is largely the same. It does have some engraving on the back, on the polished portion of the case back, though, which is a deviation from what Rolex does. Nevertheless, not really a big deal. It has the uh, same sort of tooth profile, so the tool that you would use to unscrew this case back in the event that you would need to, I think it's absolutely identical, and if it's not, it's a very similar style profile to... Uh, to unscrew this case back. So yeah, keep that in mind. In terms of how the case back's different, other than that engraving, it's like you can't even tell. Well, how do the bezels compare on these two watches? First things first, the bezel assemblies are not identical. I think that this bezel assembly on the Genoa is supposed to very accurately represent or replicate the way the bezel assembly on last generation Submariner worked. So while the case is very similar to last generation Submariner, this bezel assembly, and of course the bezel insert, is also very similar. I can tell you that based on touch and feel, the fluted edges of the bezel on the Genoa, it's not quite as aggressive. On the Submariner, you really get a lot of bite on these fluted or uh, textured edges when you're manipulating the, uh, the Submariner. And it's not insignificant. It, they do feel different. You would not mistake one for the other if your eyes were closed and kind of just touching the edges. In terms of functionality, how do they feel when you're using them? Well, we'll go ahead and look at the Genoa first. It is not quite as smooth turning as the Submariner. And as you get to the position that you want to stop the bezel at, there's just a little bit of back play. It is extremely smooth rotating though. You don't need any hard overt downward pressure to rotate it. It's very, very smooth, but when it's stopped in the position that you want it to stop at, and I went past the 12 there foolishly, I'll try to go around again one more time. When you have it lined up and stopped where you want to stop it, it doesn't feel as though that you're going to accidentally slip it out of position. It locks up tightly. Very, very well done. Just a little bit of back play in it. When we look at the Rolexes, it is 
different? Is it better? I guess I would probably describe it better. We already talked about the bezel assembly, and we'll come in here and look at the profile, the fluting on the profile of the bezel. Let's bring the Genoa in here and side by side. Visually, they really don't look significantly different, but you can feel that the Rolexes is just a hair more aggressive. If we look at the actual side profile, it's a little bit different, but very, very similar. Manipulating the bezel on the Rolex, you can probably hear that. It has a much more positive snap or clack as you're turning it, but it's just absolutely buttery smooth. It works like you would expect a Rolex to work. When you want to line the zero marker up to a position, you know, snap it in place. There's a hair of play there too, honestly. Not maybe as much back play as seen on the Genoa, but yeah, it doesn't uh, just stop and stay locked. You, there's just a hair of play to bring it back into position there. I would say that it really doesn't matter. I mean, is one better than the other? I guess if I had to give one the you know, the, the, the points or, or the score to score the win, I guess. Yeah, I would say that the Rolexes is a little bit better just because of how silky, buttery, smooth, and satisfying rotating that bezel feels by comparison. But it is just, you know, again, that idea of diminishing returns. It's very, very, very minor. The degrees of difference that separate the bezel assemblies on these two watches... It's very, very minor. That's the best way that I could describe it. Now, when we talk about the bezel inserts, that's where things start to get a lot different. The Rolex, of course, uses this black ceramic bezel insert. The graduations and numerals on the bezel are engraved and platinum filled. On the Genoa, you just have a simple aluminum bezel insert, and the graduations and numerals on that are simply painted on. Um, yeah, I mean, ceramic is a more costly pro product to produce and to implement into these watches, so I guess we could say that that is better. But some people like the aluminum. I will say that I prefer that on the aluminum insert, it's not so glossy. And over on the left here, my hand is hiding the light so that it's not so reflective. And you can just see that that glossy ceramic bezel, as I move my hand back and forth, I mean, it is just aggressively reflective. You don't get that uh, so much on, on, on an aluminum style insert. It's more of a matte finish. That's kind of a plus in my book. But in terms of overall quality, especially when we consider the platinum filled numerals, the fact that they're etched into, like as you run your finger over it, you can feel those graduations and numbers etched into the ceramic, yeah, it's, it's a better quality product. And that's probably one of the weakest points on this Genoa. And I don't want to call it a weak point. I'm saying it's one of the weaker points that take this out of the idea that this really is a luxury watch. A lot of people don't like the fact that this is just an aluminum bezel insert. The 12 o'clock or zero marker on the bezel of the Rolex has their little pearl insert. Of course, it's illuminated with their chromolite. It's really, really well implemented. On the Genoa, we also have a illuminated pearl or pip at the zero marker as well. You can see that the stainless steel surrounding isn't quite as substantial on the Genoa's insert. Uh, but nevertheless, it's, it's well done also. It's just, uh, I don't know, if you look at them side by side, it might be difficult to really see in the camera. The, there's some significance or some substance to, to the pearl on the Rolex marker. And it just doesn't exist quite the same way on the Genoa. Now, while the Genoa Ocean Rover takes a lot of design cues from the previous generation's Rolex Submariner style, in particular the slimmer, more streamlined looking case de design, including those thinner, more downward tapering lugs, the uh, crown guards over at the three o'clock side surrounding our screw down crown, and of course the bezel assembly and insert, those are all very much inspired by last generation's Submariner, which is a fan favorite amongst a lot of you guys. One of the things that they have taken from the new generation Submariner is the dial design. 
On a previous generation Submariner, the markers on the dial are much smaller, but you can see on both the Rolex and the Genoa on the right, all of the markers are, you know, maxi, I guess is what we would call them, the maxi dial style. They're 30% larger than the older style Submariner. This is a deviation that Genoa made that was very well thought out. I much prefer the maxi style case or not case, I'm sorry, the maxi style dial that they're using here that Rolex has moved to over this current generation of the Submariner. Now, we'll take a look at the dials up close on both of them. The, uh, the dial on the Rolex is, of course, you know, outstanding, magnificent, whatever you want to say. All of the markers are 18 karat white gold applied markers, so the surrounding borders of each of those markers are 18 karat white gold, which gives it, of course, a high gloss or mirrored shine finish, but it's a very warm looking metal. It's not as as cold as normal stainless steel. That's the only way that I can describe it, but the application of all of the markers is outstanding. They're, of course, filled with... Um, the chromolite luminescent paint, and we'll do some lume comparisons here shortly. On the Genoa, we have a very similar, I mean almost identical style, in that the markers are of the same size and dimension, but of course all of the surrounds of each marker, including the hands as well, is just stainless steel. There's no 18 karat white gold here to be found on this watch, and you would expect at this price point that they would not be using precious metals, even on something as small as the surrounding borders of the markers. That the size and scale of each markers, are, of these markers, are the same on both watches, again, is a very big plus in my book. Now, as you've probably noticed, the handsets do differ quite a bit, and this is another deviation that Genot decided that they would go with. They decided to use a style of hands that was found briefly on some military-issued Rolex Submariners from the Submariners that we now refer to as the Mill Sub. I believe those were in production in the late 60s or early 70s, if I'm not mistaken, very briefly. Reference numbers 5513 or 5516 or 17. Very rare watches, very expensive watches. If you were ever to try to purchase an original Rolex Mill Sub, it would be tens and tens, upwards of $100,000. They decided to go with that style of handset, and it was a great decision to differentiate itself from every other style of Submariner homage watch. We'll bring back over the actual Rolex here and take a look at its handset. Of course, it uses basically ubiquitous for the Rolex brand, that Mercedes-style handset. You can see that the hour hand has the sort of Y-shaped Mercedes-style symbol with a little point. This is the handset that is most commonly found on a Submariner. And I'm really happy that they decided to deviate from this design a little bit and do something slightly different. I think that they made, again, the right decision there. Now, of course, the second hand is something that we need to talk about. This second hand on the Rolex is, you know, very basic with a loomed lollipop section out towards the end and a very small circle at the counterbalance side. The Genoa has a very different second hand, another deviation, and one that I'm not super crazy about. First of all, it's a solid red second hand. Second of all, the counterbalance side has more of a rectangular shape. And... Yeah, those two changes, I would prefer if it were just a stainless steel with uh, a normal little circle pip counterbalance. Very, very minor, and that is personal, subjective taste, but that's just how I feel about it. I wanted to share that those are differences and what my personal opinion was on those differences. Now, I did mention that the Rolexes, hour hands, minute hands, second hands, all of those markers are filled with their chromolite luminescent material. On the Genoa, you can see that the coloration of the fill of all of the markers on the dial as well as the handset is a little bit different. It's not this nice dark white coloration. What we have here is what they call the gold sand loom. I'll bring in a loom shot of both of these watches side by side so that you can kind of see how they compare to one another. Um, loom for me is not an important factor, so I'm not even going to share my opinions on which one looks better, which one's more effective. 
because frankly, I just don't care. I don't use the loom. Like, I never read a watch in the dark. It's, I've, I've never had it come up. But I will show you guys the differences so that you can kind of make your own judgment on that. Both of these watches have a date complication at the 3 o'clock position, and both of them use a Cyclops magnifier. The Rolex Cyclops magnifier is somewhat ubiquitous for the brand. When you see a Cyclops magnifier on a Submariner or a Datejust, you just kind of think Rolex. At least I do, and I think a lot of people do as well. On the Genoa, the Cyclops magnifier is implemented in some ways better and, well, not better, but in some ways equal and in some ways not quite as well. In terms of equality, both have what appears to me to be the same level of magnification at two and a half times, and that's absolutely outstanding. I've reviewed Steinhardt watches in the past, and the magnification on those watches falls just completely short. I don't know if it's even a one and a half times level of magnification. If you're not going to implement magnification on your Cyclops magnifier to this level, I say don't put a magnifier on your watch. I'm really glad that they made sure that they got the level of magnification correct when they decided to build this Genoa Ocean Rover. Now, a couple of places where it falls slightly short is that, as you can see on the Rolex, I hope, the clarity on the magnifier, it's described as looking into the black hole. There's no glare. It is very, very clear. It's very crisp. Rolex applies an anti-reflective coating underneath that magnifier to ensure that your date is legible in all lighting conditions. On the other hand, you don't have that on the Genoa. And you can probably even tell here in this video slightly that it's just not quite as crisp and clear looking through that magnifier. There is another reason that I think it falls slightly short, and you can probably also tell on the Genoa the date wheel background color is that sort of golden off-white color, whereas on the Rolex it is white with black text. That punch of contrast on the Rolex really makes it legible, and it's a little less punchy on the Genoa. In most lighting situations, you can read the date on the Genoa. It's not really a problem, but it does suffer from some legibility problems depending on the surroundings of what your room or if you're outside and there's a lot of light. It just depends on what's reflecting in through that magnifier. It does affect the legibility of reading the date a little bit. But again, I'm really happy that they've implemented at least the correct level of magnification, and I've never really seen anybody else get that right. So, you know, that's outstanding in my book. I don't want to get too deep into it, but I will briefly mention, of course, the Rolex uses their Caliber 3135 in-house movement, and Genoa uses what they call the Caliber 7275, which is a movement that they've built based on an ETA 2824-2 clone. I mean, the Rolex movement is one of the best. You know, that's all we really need to say about it. It is absolutely outstanding. It's accurate. It is robust. It's reliable. It is known as being... Outstanding. Again, it's perfect. Let's call it perfect. The movement that we have inside the Genoa, at least so far in my experience, has been very good. It is got 38 hour power reserve, which does fall about 10 hours short of the Rolex, but it does run at 28,800 vibrations per hour, which will make a lot of enthusiasts happy, providing us with that very smooth sweeping seconds hand that we've all, you know, come to know and love. This movement from Genoa, while not an official certified chronometer because it's not subjected to the requirements of being a Swiss watch, is regulated in five positions at the company over the course of six weeks. So it is accurate. This movement for me has been very accurate. Uh, you know, it's, it's not a bad movement. I'm impressed with what they've done here. The bracelets on these watches are quite similar. Of course, what we have on the Rolex is their Oyster bracelet with a uh, glide lock safety clasp, I believe is what they call it. I, I don't remember off the top of my head. It's an Oyster bracelet, though, with an amazing clasp. Let's put it at that. The bracelet that's on this Genoa is a very faithful representation of that bracelet. 
Now, this bracelet is one of the other things that Juno does not make. They source it from an Asian company is what they informed me. I didn't ask which Asian company, and frankly, I don't care. It could be China, Singapore, whatever. It doesn't really matter. But it is a very faithful representation of the new modern style glide lock safety clasp and oyster bracelet. Previous generations of Submariners used not an outstanding bracelet, let's be honest. And that they decided to say, you know, we're, we're mimicking a lot of more older style watches, but we want the best possible quality in terms of comfort. We're going to go with a new style bracelet. They made, they made a really good decision there. How do these bracelets differ? Well, let's take a close look at them. First, let's take a look at the end links on these two watches. And I'm pointing this out because nice, solid, machined end links like we're finding on both of these watches are a costly addition to a bracelet. I've read that end links that are solidly machined like this, and I'm not talking about solid end links, I'm talking about machined end links, can add upwards of cost of over $200 to the cost of your bracelet and or watch. Uh, I was doing a little research on that subject, and that's what I've read. Hopefully it's <laughs> not uh, fake news, but, you know, that's what I could find. That said, both of the end links on these on either one of these watches, I mean, they're, they're exquisitely well done. Both of them, outstanding, very tight fit on the, on the Juneau. Of course, you know, what you would expect on the Rolex is just absolutely perfect. If you were only able to see pictures of the end links of these two watches side by side, and I can't really get a good frame uh, from the camera, you might not know which is which. They're both done perfectly. Moving on to the bracelet. Well, we'll take a look at the Rolex Oyster bracelet as, you know, the point of comparison here. Three-piece links, beautiful brushing, polished on the sides of the links which comes down to a very small taper of about 16 millimeters, starting at 20 at the lugs of the case. It terminates into their glide lock safety clasp, and it also has screwed in links like you would expect from a high quality watch like this. The bracelet's fold open safety latch is just absolutely perfect. Just the right amount of tension and then there is the hinged portion of the clasp, which opens up to the beautifully finished, very robust machined swing arm. Those blades are really well done, polished, excellent. And then of course we'll have the glide lock clasp, which I'll demonstrate and talk about that a little bit more in a second. By comparison on the Genot, we have again those excellent end links, comes down to the same style three piece links of the oyster style bracelet polished on the sides just like the Rolex. Same dimensions from 20 down to about 16, which terminates into the glide lock style clasp. Obviously there's a big difference in that the fold over safety latch on the clasp of the Genoa has no logo or anything here. This is a little bit of a problem. Let me bring the uh, Rolex over to demonstrate what I'm talking about. On the Rolex, you have the Coronet logo there on the uh, on the flippy, the flip lock safety latch. And getting your finger under there and popping that open is just the easiest thing in the world. On the other hand, it is not the easiest thing in the world to do on the Juno. Uh, your fingernail just doesn't want to go over under there as, as, as easily. You could probably flip it up from the sides maybe a little bit easier. Now one of the first noticeable differences when we're talking about this bracelet, number one, it's not quite as rigid as the Rolexes. There's more flex, there's more play. Number two, when you're feeling the articulation on the Genoa, it's a little bit gritty. And if you take a look at this, when you fold this first link, you see how it kind of just gets stuck there? There's like a, there's like a level of friction and it just gets, you know, it just kind of sticks there. On the other hand, the, the the Rolex's bracelet is just, you know, silky smooth. The articulation is perfect. There's no there's no interferences with the uh, horns of the lugs and the first link on the bracelet. It's outstanding. Now I demonstrated on the Rolex already how easy it is to use the uh, flip lock or or the the safety flip latch. Now, number one, since you don't have any sort of logo or protrusion, you don't have something to really get your fingernail underneath of. 
Number two, it definitely doesn't offer you the same sort of super refined level of quality when, when you're feeling that latch open up. Same thing when you're opening the hinged portion of the clasp. It's, it's good, don't get me wrong, but it kind of, there's like some resistance here. I can't really demonstrate it on camera. You can kind of see gravity isn't even pulling it open because it's just a little gritty and tight. The, the, the finishing is quite good though. That is actually sand or bead blasted in the center portion of this swing arm, but it's nicely polished on the rest of the pieces. Just not, the, the whole bracelet assembly is not quite up to the standards of the Rolexes. Uh, and, and you can really feel it, but it is much nicer than you're gonna find in the majority of watches that are more affordable than this. If you wanna, you know, people are gonna say, well, I could spend 600 bucks and 500, 500 bucks and get a better or equal quality watch. No, you're probably not going to. And that even includes this bracelet. This bracelet exceeds the majority of more entry level affordable watch bracelets that I have seen. So I'm putting this in the context of comparing it directly to the Rolexes. The quality is very good, but you know, not quite there. Now, another thing to note, and I'll try to get my camera to focus, some of the edges, I don't know if it'll show up well on camera, like this edge here, it's just a little rough, it's a little unfinished, very ever so slightly. I don't know if I can get a good focus on it, but I can feel it, I can see it, it's, it's not as smooth and well, well finished as it is on the Rolex. You kind of find that in a few spots on the bracelet, around some of these top grooves here. Uh, it's just not the same level of uh, precision finishing, but again, compare it to something much more affordable and you know, it's significantly better. I don't dislike this bracelet. I think it's very well done. Keep in mind, I'm putting it in context with the Rolex bracelet. The final thing to talk about on the bracelet, and oh, I did mention that this is also a uh, screwed link bracelet system as well. As you can see there, there's the screws. I think they're the exact same size as the Rolex, 1.6 millimeters. Jeannot includes a screwdriver with their watch. So the last thing to talk about on the bracelet is the glide lock. As you guys are probably well aware, you flip this portion up and you can toollessly adjust up to 20 millimeters the, the uh, sizing of the bracelet. And when you find your spot, you just flip it back down. The engagement of the glide lock works quite well. No problems with that at all. Stays locked down for me. Look, comes you know up and back in very, very easily. The actual sizing is very gritty though. It's nowhere near as smooth as the Rolex. And let me preface that by, by saying that that was a complaint of mine on the Rolex, that the Rolex adjusting the glide lock is not particularly smooth. This is much worse. Um, not though as if it's unusable, but you will most certainly notice a distinct difference when you're manipulating that glide lock on the Jeannot bracelet. And uh, again, as you're closing it, it just it's a little stiff, it's a little tight. You can feel that it's not that very, very highly precise machining. You know, it's, it's, it's not bad, again, don't get me wrong, but that's probably one of the main places that you're gonna see big differences between the Submariner and the Jeannot. It's in the bracelet. The Rolex Oyster bracelet is basically perfection. It stands head and shoulders above this bracelet on the Jeannot. But finally, let me one more time preface or, 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 or tell you that the Jeannot's bracelet is quite good. All right, guys, I guess that's everything I can go over on these two watches. I think I've compared every major portion or system on the watch relatively sufficiently, I guess I should say. Uh, stick with me for a few more minutes. I'll do my final thoughts or closing thoughts before we wrap up this video. If you have any questions, of course, let me know in the comments down below. But Hopefully I covered everything, I think I did, and uh, yeah, let's pop back over to the, uh, the other studio view. Well, there you have it. There is my comparison review of the Rolex Submariner with the Jeannot Ocean Rover. I hope you enjoyed it. What are my final thoughts or closing thoughts on this watch or the comparison of these two watches? Well, of course, the Rolex does pull ahead of the Jeannot in terms of quality of fit and finish, certainly in terms of heritage or prestige, if you will, just by having the name Rolex on the dial, 
there's a little bit of a, I don't know, je ne sais quoi about that watch that in its own right is why people love it. But the Genot is an outstanding watch and it's not like it's, if we could kind of describe it as being eight times worse. No, it's not eight times worse. It's about eight times less money, but it's actually pretty close in terms of quality, in terms of value for money. It's surprising how well made this Genot is. Do I think that Genot is going to unseat Rolex as the king of the luxury dive watch? No, absolutely not. But it's an outstanding watch, and I think that you should strongly consider it if it's a style that you like, and you don't really have the money to invest into an eight plus thousand dollar watch like the Rolex. There would be no shame in owning this Juno. You're getting an extremely good quality product for your money. Speaking of the style of the watch, this is going to be a point of contention for a lot of people. Why did Juno decide to do an homage watch to the Rolex Submariner? Well, a few things about that. First of all, I do like homage watches. I've reviewed several of them. I don't have a problem with them. I don't think that they're just counterfeits. I don't think that they're just replicas. In particular on this Genot watch, the thing that I find most appealing about it is that it's not a direct one-for-one -one homage to a specific model of Rolex. It integrates some of the best aspects of multiple models and generations of the Submariner, and I think that was an excellent d design choice by Genot. They used the modern six-digit reference bracelet and the maxi dial with the now discontinued but extremely popular five-digit di reference case design. Of course, they used that 1960s or 70s era mil-sub handset, and they did a lot of things that, frankly, you don't see on a Rolex. For example, you're never going to find a Rolex with this gold sand loom or the blue bezel with the gold printing. Admittedly, at first, that wasn't my favorite design cue, but it actually has grown on to me, and it is... It's really good, to be to be frank. I do like it. Generally, I'm a little bit more conservative in my style. I tend to like black dials and black bezels, and it just goes with everything. If I was a little more adventurous, I could see having this as an only dive watch. I could certainly see having it in addition to a little bit more of a conservative option that I might wear more routinely. All right, guys, I'm going to close out this review and say thanks again for tuning in. As always, if you want to help support the channel, there's a few things you can do down in the description of this and every single video I produce. You'll find links to my social media. Please do go over and follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, whichever social media platform you prefer. Also, if you want to support me on Patreon, I could always use more monthly contributions over there. That would be an outstanding help to the channel. Finally, down in the description, you will always find links to Amazon through my affiliate account. If you like anything that I've reviewed and you'd like to purchase it, if you click on my link first and then purchase it, I get a small commission. It doesn't matter if you buy something that I review or anything else for that matter. Those commissions add up and they do help support the channel. I really appreciate you tuning in. Thanks for everything. And until the next one, we'll see you later. Bye now.